A very good evening to you and welcome to Busy Focus. You are with me, Azra Hassan. And tonight with me is the President of the National Chamber of Exporters, Mr. Ramal Jasinghe. Good evening, sir, and it's good nice evening. to have you back. Thank you, Azra. <laughs> so, Mr. Jasinghe, going straight into the topic, how do you think exports in Sri Lanka uh, has uh, been, um, has it increased or has it taken a step, in, step back? How do you think it's moving? All right, year over year, in the year 2018, we saw an improvement. And that was also month over month, uh, incremental improvement. And uh, we were heading fairly steadily. Mm -hmm. And at the end of October, we closed on 50, on a note of 15 billion uh, US dollars in terms of export against a target of 17 billion, which we need to meet by the end of the year or in, the, in a couple of days mm -hmm. time. So I would say a lot of, uh, Action had been taken, a lot of things worked, particularly the services sector, we saw improvements. Then we saw improvements uh, in the agriculture sector that contributed mainly to the export growth. And uh, towards uh, September, we had tourism also getting included as an export into the export basket. Right. So all in all, the picture seemed promising. So it is in a good position, <coughs> are we moving forward? It is like this, over the last 51 days, we saw a slowing down because of the uncertainties and the political turmoil that uh, we all witnessed. Mm -hmm. So there was a slowdown and also we had the concerns of the EU and the US uh, concessions or the general uh, preference uh, scheme or the GSP scheme may have been, uh, we had ran the risk of that being uh, withdrawn. So the importance or the significance of that is that 70% of our items that are exported on goods enjoy a GSP concession. Right. So if that had been withdrawn, we would have had a real uphill task. So fortunately, that, has, that never went out and uh, it has been restored, but now we've got to play catch up over the last 51, what we went through the, over the last 51 days. Right, so even uh, issuing a statement yesterday, the European Union <coughs> and the US Ambassador in Sri Lanka, they have given us assurance that uh, there will come in the steps that have been taken by the political authorities in the country. Catching up is going to be a bit of a challenge. It How bad is it going to be? All that is like this, I can speak for what I saw a while ago on the tea exports. And uh, the association says that they have a target of 15.5 billion, mm -hmm. but they are concerned about the 0.5 uh, billion uh, US dollar target. So they might reach, the, there is a growth of 4% year over year, which is promising. But again, you have the estate sector right now with the labor issues that yeah. and they're on strike. So getting that, meeting the target could be a challenge. But nevertheless, they've shown growth. And of course, the tea sector is doing, uh, taking certain actions on how they can sustain the growth into the next year. So we might, we will have a shortfall definitely because catching up on 50 days in what I, what I talk about two weeks right, mm -hmm. is a near impossible task. So fortunately, the contracts uh, that our exporters enjoyed remain by and large intact. Mm. So <coughs> it, everything should go well, but unfortunately, we are going into the holiday season <laughs> the next week. So that could uh, hamper uh, the, our progress. And anyhow, we are still soldiering on because as we speak, we still don't have a cabinet. So there's a, we are trying to do this business of exports in the middle of all uncertainties around. But however, I think looking forward that we have matured as a society and also as an export community that irrespective of the political uh, environment, that we should come to a level of business as usual, provided we have the uh, good relationships and where the political environment is concerned, that we maintain the advantages of the privileges that we enjoy with countries like the EU and uh, the US, mm. so that we have a smooth uh, flow of our exports. I think it is uh, commendable <coughs> the fact that uh, with all of this conf confusion in the country, uh, the export sector still is going strong, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and we, we expect all sectors in the country to have a downfall or collapse because of this uh, uncertainty in the country. But uh, to hear you say that we are actually mm -hmm. moving forward, but in a slow rate. I think that is quite... Um, yeah, the thing is we didn't crash. In a normal scenario, if you took everything, I mean, what you see, I've seen in other uh, situations or other countries that have such a similar situation, hmm. it has seen a crash. 
but <coughs> we didn't crash and I think that's remarkable. So because does it mean that we have laid a good foundation? Definitely. And also I have a lot of hope on the national export strategy, the uh -huh. NDS, hmm. which even over the last 50 days there was certainty that that wouldn't be changed. Hmm. So moving forward we need to get that uh, program implemented and uh, the mechanisms to enable the NDS to actually work should be now strengthened. So that would ensure that if we are lost a billion or two in terms of target, because the next, I think by 2020 we are looking at 20 billion in terms of export, which is not too hard a target I feel, then the, we should be able to get to exceed there. So if we have the structures or the infrastructures kept intact and uh, maybe developed, yes I think there is hope. But uh, it requires stability in the country, the consistency. Definitely of uh, policies and... So that is where the NES comes into play because we have all for the longest time been uh, clamoring about the inconsistency of policies and now we have it through the NES. So that's why I said a while ago, where well, if we have the NES implemented, that brings in that incon that brings in the consistency. So therefore, we have a uh, open roadmap or we can develop a roadmap to take us where we need to go in terms of increased uh, exports. Hmm. But we, uh, the cabinet <coughs> is yet to be uh, sworn in and uh, we still have our ministers to be appointed uh, to take up the relevant mm. ministries. How will that affect, uh, don't you think that delaying this process can affect us, uh, the, your industry yeah. more? Uh, it's like this, what we proved over the last 51 days is that we've been resilient as an industry, as an export community, we've been resilient. I mean, let's face it, for the last at least for the last one month, we didn't have a government or a couple of weeks. Hmm. Technically, there wasn't a government and still business went on. Yes. So I think the, uh, there is a very good connect between uh, export and the buyers and an understanding. So you know, I think we developed relationships. But of course, it cannot be kept, taken for granted or we cannot be in a complacent situation. Sure. Yeah. I think more or less everybody was on a wait and see uh, mode. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we have overcome that at least for the time being. And now we got to strengthen on those, uh, on the actions that we took over the last 50 days, where we didn't allow our export performance to drop drastically. It has dropped, but I think it's dropped to a level that we could catch up, hmm. but not to the level of uh, target, I doubt. Right. Very we can much. survive. Yes, but not thrive. So the idea is to thrive, right? So we should uh, get to the thrive mode as fast as possible. So with that, we'll go into a short commercial break. Uh, don't go away. After all, this is the Basin Focus. Welcome back to Basin Focus. If you're just joining us, I'm in conversation with the President of the National Chamber of Exporters, Mr. Ramal Jasingha. Jasingha Mr. Jasingha, we were talking about the how the political situation in the country has affected the um, exporters in the country. Now, uh, apparel industry is considered as one of the industries that bring money into the country. How has this, uh, be, has it been affected? Are there right, It's like this, in the national export strategy, they have identified the apparel, the apparel industry as a mature industry. Mm -hmm. Because now it's reached its maturity. And from there, it's a matter of extending, as you say in any marketing science, I mean, trying to extend the, right. the life of the apparel industry. So the latest information that we have is that the offtake or the purchasing or the growth in exports to the U.S. has slowed down by about three to four percent because of the buying power of the U.S. citizen. Uh, they see a drop in that, and uh, we are seeing countries like China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia overtaking us in terms of apparel export right. over this time. So that's a challenge. And also, however, the EU exports have grown by about 4%. So if we have an overall increase, growth of about 5%, that would be good. But uh, moving forward, I feel that uh, we are competing against countries that have a lower labor cost. Mm. And uh, whether we can sustain the cost because our costs of production are increasing in Sri Lanka. So probably there might be a window of opportunity where we become part of the value chain and uh, from there try to still maintain or improve our export performance. So that is the story for apparel. So there has been a slight drop. So then uh, you mentioned about the cost of production <coughs> and uh, appearing on one of our shows before you have mentioned about how uh, costly 
this cost of production is because when it comes to uh, producing your mm. uh, goods, uh, you use the imports. The value addition aspect. So right. this is something actually this morning I was with the Nanotechnology Institute that has a very, very good uh, research facility. I would say it is world class. Mm -hmm. And they are working with a few private sector companies like LOLC, uh, Brandix, Mass. And uh, they, it looks like a perfect uh, private uh, state, uh, public private partnership. So I think that would be the future where we develop. Uh, we develop import substitution uh, components that can be manufactured here right. or maybe you go into a blue ocean area where we have endemic plants here where you do some extracting and some research where we could actually create a product now what was interesting this in this morning's conversation that they have a anti-aging cream which I'm sure it will catch up around mm. the world very quickly and uh, that seems to be pretty unique the ingredients will be pretty unique here so we'll have to look at new areas because we have our export structure is confined to tea, apparels, and rubber, and a few items, and gems, and jewelry. Yeah. But if we can expand the slew of uh, items that we can give out there, mm -hmm. then we sustain ourselves. The other thing is services. Now, services don't have a GSP or any such uh, concession. Right. And there is much promise in services. Now, over the last 50 days, we have seen the service sector drop, and so has the manufacturing sector. So catching up on those, we would have to use some innovative measures. But the whole uh, the whole thing is where the scientific and research uh, and development community should come forward and tie up with us, with the exporters. So this morning I did sign a MOU with the National Chamber of Exporters and uh, the Nanotechnology Institute, where we, ex we expose our members to the facilities and if one of our members need to see, say, for example, for pepper, they need some uh, expertise. Because if you put the pepper into a particular form, it has a huge demand in a country like Switzerland that mm. makes a pepper spray that right. makes people like you secure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think those are new areas that we can work on. So I think we are the first chamber to actually tie up with the scientific institute. I'm quite proud of that. And I think moving forward, that would be the way to uh, mitigate the risk that we meet. Right. Because what happened 50 days ago can happen six months down the line. It can happen at any time. But whether we will be as lucky to recover from that would be, we wouldn't know. I think uh, given the experience that we've had, I think <coughs> we should be proactive instead of exactly. being reactive. So exactly. is that what you're trying to tell That's by? what I'm saying, yeah. Right. And uh, when it comes to um, manufacturing uh, subsidies for imports in the yeah. country, do we have the potential, the talent in the country to do all of that? What about our local manufacturers? Are they capable of doing it or is that... Why, I mean, are we utilizing them enough? The other thing, now, take yourself as an industrialist or a local manufacturer, I mean, you're fighting against the skills shortage, the labor shortage, the increasing, and it's difficult to get people to work. Then you have to make, keep your house fires burning, you've got to meet your stake or shareholder or stakeholder expectations, then you've got to run profitably. Then on the other hand, your imports or the cost of production is uh, challenged. Mm -hmm. So with all that, they have very little time to devote towards research and development. Right. And I think very few, there are a few companies that do have a research and development uh, unit, but it will be confined to probably their interests. So this is where the scientific community has been quiet for the longest time. I think this all happened around about the mid 80s or early 90s, where earlier we did have a strong manufacturing base. But when it came to scale of production, we lost out. So it was not uh, feasible cost to manufacture an item when you have when you can get it at half the price and double the quantity from a country like China or Bangladesh. Hmm. So therefore the manufacturing sector suffered. And you can see a lot of I mean factories that were there earlier probably are making I know a factory that was in battery manufacturing now making joysticks. Right? So it's a shame. But I think we can quietly get back because there are so many areas. Uh, one other thing uh, is on, on our mining, on our minerals, mm -hmm. where a lot of work can be done on that for value addition. It's not just digging up and sending our raw materials abroad without any value addition. Right. But so there's scope. So what I would see over the next year or two, hopefully, if all goes well, an expansion of uh, uh, of uh, new products getting into the export uh, spectrum. Right. Uh, we have a lot more to talk about, but we'll be back after this short commercial break. <laughs> Thank you.
Welcome back to Biz in Focus. I'm in conversation with uh, Mr. Ramal Jasingha, the president of the National Chamber of Exporters. Mr. Jasingha, now uh, Sri Lanka is not the only country that is uh, facing issues when it comes to the political arena. Uh, for instance, the United Kingdom, they have the issues with the Brexit deal. How will Brexit uh, affect uh, Sri Lanka, a country as small as Sri Lanka? How will it affect All right, it, has, it is a very significant issue that we need to think about right now. Mm -hmm. uh, for one thing is, out of exports to the EU, Britain takes over 30% of our exports right. and therefore we enjoy the benefits from the EU. But the other day I met an Englishman who was at a presentation I made and when I raised it he said the best way you can sort the EU out, you tell the ladies in London that their lingerie is going to cost more mm -hmm. if they do not give us extend the GSP and the, and the uh, facilities that they enjoy right now. Because uh, I think the EU is one of the main uh, at least Britain is one of the main uh, destinations for apparel and uh, foundation garments. So I'm sure that and the long relationship and the cozy relationship that and the association we had with Britain over the, for the longest time, I'm sure that we can arrive at uh, restoring probably even better conditions. Hmm. And there's also thought that probably the Commonwealth rather than the EU might uh, give a better access to uh, if uh, that block can actually come up with a similar arrangement and uh, also access to new markets. But these are still thoughts. Right. I think it is the implementation that matters the most. Yes. And also forward thinking because from now we should work on because, okay, it's virtually, okay, the Brexit is in the balance and I think the Prime Minister of uh, Britain is making headway there. So we need to be alert because a country like us, though small, we have, it has a big impact. Right. on our exports and also on our economy. So what do we do then? So do we wait till the last minute? But I think it's about time that we started preparing and thinking about the impact and what we need to do in the event of a Brexit. Right. So um, now uh, going back to the situation here at home, the damage has been done and uh, at least to a certain extent. What do you suggest that we do to make sure that we will not fall into a situation again when it comes to your industry? That's an excellent question, Asra, because what happened in the thick of things, the joint chamber movement, all the major chambers in the country got together. Mm. And at least the fact that we could all work together was a victory. And if you put our strengths together, that's the basically the economy of the country. And we, it's the private sector. And that is a very strong and formidable uh, group. Now, if that unity remains, and actually we all got together and we met His Excellency the President about two weeks ago and addressed the concerns. Now, there was a discussion and uh, I think that would be the future so that whatever political environment, if the chambers get together, mm. then we are strength and uh, we might be able to mitigate the risk that such a uh, uh, situation or maybe even a worse situation if it does arise, that the joint chambers will have a say in the running of the country and at least in the economic side because at the end of the day if we don't uh, manufacture and if we don't export and if we don't produce or if we don't uh, express ourselves as a voice then we will not be heard and uh, then you cannot sustain the mm. economic uh, the economy of the country so for the longest time it has been i mean the balance has been state and the private sector but as they say, the private sector, the engine of growth. Hmm. So forgetting any political uh, uncertainty, at least to develop the country, I think all of us, irrespective of our status, and we have seen that, we have met a point of congruence, that we will get together on the issues and we will address these issues mm -hmm. and move forward as a national movement. And the encouraging thing, Azra, was that uh, when we tried to meet, there are foreign chambers like the AmCham, uh, the European Chamber, the German Chamber. Yes. They too were ready to work with us. Yes. So I think that entire the chamber movement in its entirety, both the national and the uh, expat chambers, can make a significant difference. Right, but how are you going to uh, encourage and uh, encourage the local manufacturers here in Sri Lanka <coughs> to be like, stay strong, we are still going to get through this. How are you going to do that? So that would be again our role, the role that we play in terms of the free trade agreements that are around to make sure that they are secure. Mm. All right, we understand and we respect the view that you need a mechanism to get inclusion into the global marketplace yes. as well as uh, to be able to 
expand our markets because catering to 22 million people will get us nowhere. Mm. So we need uh, free trade, but it has to be equitable. And also there's got to be a cooling off period. Now there's a thing called a negative list where so many items on that list can be traded here without any barriers. Yes. But do we enjoy that same thing in those territories? Mm -hmm. And also you have the question of scale. Right. So these are issues that need to secure or we need to sort out to secure our manufacturers. And also for our items to meet the so-called standards that they would require, we need a period. So maybe uh, there are items that might take off immediately some items that will take time. Now we've done well in the confectionery industry. Hmm. We have uh, biscuit manufacture and uh, certain items that have done well in the and tea, branded tea that have done well in the overseas markets. But in overseas markets you find non-tariff barriers which is not in the written in black and white. Right. But you'll find interstate uh, barriers mm -hmm. and then you have quarantine and so many other issues that go beyond the scope of the FTA. In short, uh, you might say they, it's dirty tricks, right, to make sure that your items don't get a free flow there. But mm -hmm. as far as we are concerned, we are very open and what you see is what you get. So that has to be addressed with whatever arrangements we get. And also through uh, research and develop to make sure that we have consistency in supply and right. consistency in standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's other concept of country of origin, <coughs> which uh, is essential for international trade. And uh, we need to get the, uh, uh, find a roadmap to make sure that we are qualified or that we get into the country origin uh, standards. So those are uh, issues that we are working on right now. Right. And I think once we iron that out, our local manufacturer would be more encouraged and more secure mm -hmm. to invest in R&D as well as in uh, capacity building. Right. Mr. Jasing, a one final question. Now, uh, people of this country, I think what they need right now is assurance. Assurance that uh, the sector, your export sector, we water the sector will not collapse. Mm. What, ca what can you tell about the, at least the near future? Are we, can we move forward? Can we achieve the targets that we have laid for us uh, at least in the next year? Right. This was, uh, we have come to the stage either you produce or perish or you export or perish so there yes. is no looking back mm -hmm. right so we got to find some way out and the only way is forward or the only way is up you you can't go down you can't get worse right or stop or you, you can't <laughs> <laughs> so other we collapse as an economy right. so with that backdrop all efforts should be made and particularly with policy consistency and i must say over the last three years there were attempts like the new uh, trade policy and out of which the national export uh, strategy came out. Now, if those pillars are maintained irrespective of the political environment, because those are designed uh, to, to withstand any change. And if then you get a clear path. Now, we had the vision 2025 that was uh, released a couple of uh, months ago. So if we have the roadmap, that gives a margin, of, I mean, a level of comfort to all stakeholders of the economy hmm. to work towards that. So I think that's the best assurance and also to be sincere about the implementation of these. Yeah. So <coughs> I may be talking of utopia here, right? But uh, I don't see any other way of us uh, moving forward to be sincere. Then our budget, uh, what you call vote of account should be conducive hmm. to play the catch up game first and then to maintain uh, economic growth. Right. So a lot lies again still unfortunately on the political environment but I think we matured now and we got to move away from the impact of uh, a changing political environment. Thank mm -hmm. you Mr. Jasinger for joining us on our Busy Focus uh, show tonight. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Uh, have a good night.